It's important to properly dispose of unwanted medication or sharps. MedProject offers free and convenient disposal options near you. To learn more, call 844-MEDPROJECT or visit medproject.org. Hello and welcome to History for Weirdos. We're your hosts, Andrew and Stephanie. And each week, we're going to take you on a journey into the strange, obscure, and relentlessly entertaining corners of human history. Now listen up, friends, because it's about to get weird. to the History for Weirdos podcast, episode number 92. 92 crew. 92 crew, baby. That's I, us. We were both born in 92. Yes, I know. That's pretty cool, huh? Same year, different winters. Yes, same year, different winters. I'll let you guys ponder that for a second. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and before we begin, I just want to mention that we might sound a little bit different in your ears. Hopefully in a good way. Yes, hopefully in a good way. <laughs> Because we actually upgraded our audio equipment. Yay! We both have our own microphones now. Yeah, instead of like... Um, a single one that a we single were sharing. One. Yeah, we were like huddled really close. And we would try to sit Andrew farther back <laughs> and me farther <laughs> forward because of our voice differences. Right. Stephanie has a very like soft voice and mine is booming and <laughs> makes people's earbuds bleed. <laughs> uh, according to you know a few of you all. <laughs> Not to me. Not to you. Of course not. Not at all. But so hopefully with each of us with our own microphones and some additional equipment that we have, this sounds a little clearer and crisper to you all. We hope so. If not, please don't tell us. Yeah, don't tell <laughs> us. Because <laughs> we're really excited about the new mics. Yeah, we we are both like holding our mics right now. You'll see. We'll have video like eventually. but Eventually. Eventually. No promises on when because I'm still figuring that out, guys. But... Uh, hopefully you guys just enjoy this yeah also just to plug our italy trip you guys know the deal the w the website's going to be in the dis the notes description i can't do words right now but that's it'll be really in the good notes. for a podcast i know right <laughs> it'll be in in the the description you guys go and guys seriously i am so excited about this trip yes. i've said it a million times i'll say it again it's so amazing. We had a couple new signups last week. There's yeah. still a few spots left for the early bird. So please, you guys need to get it on it ASAP. Yeah, reserve your spot, get the early bird pricing, and set up a payment plan. You only need to put down, is it 25%? Yeah, 25%. To save your spot so that we can all be in Florence and Rome next spring. How cool. I literally goosebumps. Literally I know. goosebumps. I know. So we just wanted to give that reminder uh, please don't hesitate to, you know, reach out to us on Instagram and ask questions. Absolutely. Leave us a comment um, and we'll get back to you. Exactly. And also, we won't be having a new episode next week as we'll be traveling. So just wanted to give you guys an FYI. And speaking of next week, happy Juneteenth in advance. Yeah. Next month, ne the next Monday would right. fall on Juneteenth. Um, so happy Juneteenth. We will not be having an episode because we will be out of the country. For my sister's quinceañera. Yes. Yeah. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. Lots of exciting stuff. We hope you, you know, for those of you that get the holiday off, we hope you enjoy it. Yes. I do not get it off and I'm I do. salty about it. <laughs> oh, I hate you. <laughs> good thing I'm married to you. Yeah. Good thing. <laughs> Speaking of marriage, we started a new show and this is not, we're not getting paid for this, but a really cool show that we started watching is a about a couple that starts a podcast called Based on a True Story, which is not actually based on a true story, funny enough. We did yes. some research into it. But I mean, it's really funny, it's witty, and it's a podcasting married couple. So obviously that resonates. If you are a true crime lover at all, you will like this show. It's funny. It kind of makes fun of like the true crime Right. podcasting world um i love true crime podcasts so i think it's really on the nose there and it's a, like andrew said it is a couple a married couple like us that starts a podcast together but there is a twist and we will not share what the twist is it's pretty wild it's not the type of podcast we would do no let's just say that uh, that is 100 percent correct yeah so we were watching it uh, again it's called based on true story totally not sponsored but i i said to andrew I was like we totally have to share this with the weirdos yeah i think you guys will enjoy it yeah okay 
those are all the announcements. I know we dumped a lot on you guys, but all important stuff. Yeah, no, it's it's good to keep up to date. Exactly. So without further ado, Stephanie, it's your week. What do you have for us this week? Yeah, this week I actually have an episode where the idea for this episode was suggested by a weirdo. Oh, nice. A weirdo listener by the name of Meg, I believe. She left a very compelling argument as to why I should cover this episode in a comment on our Instagram. Intriguing. And yeah, and this is a... I didn't see this. Well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I did. <laughs> so here we are. <laughs> um, this is a little plug for our Instagram to follow us there. If you don't already, you can uh, follow us at History for Weirdos. Yes. So thank you, Meg, in advance. And I will say, though, as intriguing as the story is for this week, mm -hmm. there were a lot of, um, I guess, stories that contradicted each other when I was researching this character. Oh, that's always fun. So uh, if you heard different accounts, that's very it's very possible those accounts are true. I just went with whatever I found the most consistent themes of when I would look stuff up. That's also that's I think usually like best bet. Yes, because this person was a living legend in her time. Ooh, I'm so excited. So lots of lots of lore and fantastical stories kind of um, built up around her. So today we will be covering Julie de Obni. I don't know how to say her last name. I think it's de Obni. But she was known as La Maupin, and she was a 17th century French opera singer and swordswoman. So that's not two things usually like tied together, being a swords person and an opera singer. Yes, I don't know anyone else actually in history that comes to mind that had those two titles. I, I, don't, I don't know if I can name a single opera singer, to be honest. <laughs> Besides Julie de Omni. <laughs> yeah, and it's because you literally said her name like five seconds ago. Okay, so Andrew is not a big <laughs> opera fan. We have all learned this. <laughs> well, as we can imagine, her life was filled with adventure, scandal, and incredible feats of bravery. Ooh. She was also known for a, shall we say, vibrant love life. Uh, nice. Julie Dobny lived in a time when French society began re-examining kind of gender roles and sexuality uh, but through our modern perspective we may see her as bisexual and that she enjoyed like quote cross-dressing is the term that kept coming up but she's like dressing in, in quote unquote man's clothes yeah like pants oh, okay Weird. oh yeah that's back then that's <laughs> back big, then that's, that's big time taboo <laughs> yes big deal it is the french though yes that's true and we'll get into that a little bit yeah so little is known for certain about her life her tumultuous career and her flamboyant lifestyle were the subjects of gossip rumors and lots of colorful stories even mm -hmm. when she was alive and it inspired numerous fictional portrayals of her afterward <laughs> i love that yeah so Dobni was born in either 1670 or 1673 the dates differed on that so i decided to give both uh, she was the daughter and only child of a fencing master named Gaston Dobny. <gasps> and yes, Gaston, like in Beauty and the Beast. I was literally about to ask that. Yeah, I knew Of course I'm married to you. <laughs> like, I would not, before I met you, I, that's not something I would say. You wouldn't be making a Beauty and the Beast reference? Absolutely not. Well, I'm proud. Uh, her father trained the court pages under um, Louis, <laughs> oh my gosh. What is this Roman numeral? I'm 14. so thank you. <laughs> so embarrassing. <laughs> I like, panicked looking I at it. There's a million Louis. There was a million, but this is the Sun King Louis. That's always okay. how I remember yeah, the him. The one who ruled, like he's one of the longest reigning monarchs, not like in European history. No, like of all of recorded history. Right. Mm -hmm. Like um, he was succeeded by his great grandson, I believe, the fifteenth. Something like that. There was a weird thing with the yeah. succession going on for him. Yeah. yeah. Um, so Louis the Fourteenth, the Sun King, her father taught his court pages, and Julie grew up in the great stables or the Grande Ecurie of Versailles. Oh, your French accent's so good. Thank Actually, you. Actually, I'm not qualified to make that statement, but I just think it sounds good. I'll take it. Yeah. Thank <laughs> you. So let me give us all a little Versailles uh, recap. So Louis the Fourteenth, who I just mentioned, 
the Sun King, he turned a modest hunting lodge that belonged to his father into this spectacular palace in an effort to assert his power in leading a more imposing and unified France. That was his goal. Right. And even today, as we all know, Versailles is known for its opulence and almost unrivaled splendor, I'd say. It's like obscene. Yeah, I got to go when I was a senior in high school. Oh, wow, that's really cool. Yeah, I went on a trip with my French class to I don't know why I pretended France. like I didn't know that. Like, you've told me this, like, so many times. I know, because it was so beautiful. Yeah. But thank you for um, feigning, <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. like, like, this oh was wow, news. so cool. <laughs> Tell me all about it. Yeah. It's important to properly dispose of unwanted medication or sharps. MedProject offers free and convenient disposal options near you. To learn more, call 844-MEDPROJECT or visit medproject.org. Seeing is believing, and you're not going to believe how bright and vivid the colors are on the Samsung Neo QLED and OLED TVs powered by the Neural Quantum Processor. Because this is an audio ad. Unless you can see it, which means you already have one. Nice. Samsung, more wow than ever. At, even though Versailles is so, so beautiful, very interesting to see, highly recommend it. It's definitely not overhyped. It's really cool. There's nothing like it. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, at the time... When Louis had this vision, there were no workers' rights. Oh, boy. And as a result, thousands of people died in the construction oh of Versailles. Oh, my God, that's horrific. Thousands. I didn't know that. Yeah. It's terrible. And even worse, these deaths were often due to really preventable causes, such as malnourishment of the workers and disease, which tells us a lot about the compensation and the working conditions they must have been living in. I mean, it's just so typical of this time. Yes. They did did not care about, like, workers' rights or anything. No, not the working class at all. Not the, you know, they had a peasant class at this time, and they was people were just seen as expendable, ex especially right. for the whims of a king. Yes, especially, like, a, a king like him, who or he, that is a absolute monarch. An yes. An absolute monarch, yeah. Just ab and absolutely an ass. Well, no wonder things don't go well for this family eventually. <laughs> oh, I know. I'm yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Yeah, that's, that's a good way of putting it. <laughs> yes. Well, life at Versailles was kind of a circus. And the king was the main act at that circus. People at court desperately wanted to participate in the leve ritual, which was watching the king wake up. That's so bizarre. <laughs> as well as the couche ritual, which is watching him go to bed so that they could hopefully be in the Sun King's good graces. Every hour of the day was organized with ritual and routine. Versailles, um, and as a result, France actually became the center of etiquette and of fashion and of beauty because everything was done so in these like big ceremonial ways it sounds like very meticulously it sounds so boring I, to I be know. honest and also like dude aren't you supposed to be running a country like what are <laughs> you doing like come on of course that's me as like uh, I don't know, like my like protestant like <laughs> upbringing is just like you're supposed to be running a country you're supposed to be working where's your work ethic i know I'm like, of course, that's like the one thing, not the opulence, not the absurdity. It's like, where's your work ethic? Yeah, it, it just must have been such a wild uh, time and place to be witness to. And I share all of this to put into context the unique world that La Maupin or Julie, I'll use both of those names, mm -hmm. would have grown up around. Right. Even though she grew up in the big stables. Right. I can only imagine that what it was like to be in the bubble of Versailles at its height. Oh, I can I can only imagine too. And back to Julie, I couldn't find any information on her mother, which I thought was really interesting. But her father was in charge of Julie's education. He taught her both like traditional academic subjects, mm -hmm. but he also trained her in fencing from a very young age. 
And as a result, she was quickly recognized as a fencing prodigy. And it's important to note that fencing was a completely unheard of activity for a, a woman or a girl at this time. Oh, wow. There were no other female fencers in France, at least. Yeah, that's not, that's, I guess, something <laughs> that that would only be reserved for men now that I think about it. Right. At least um, formally. At least this time. Yeah. Maybe there were little girls who would play, right? But this was formal. She would compete as a Against fencer. Against men? Yeah. By the age of 12. Oh, I guess it'd have to be. Yeah, if she's the only woman. Yes. By the age of 12, she was successfully competing against adult men. Oh, my God. Wow. It was also around this time that Julie took up her lifelong practice of dressing in what was considered to be male attire at this time. Uh, she also had a beautiful singing voice and began, began her training in singing. Do you think she ever was fencing and singing at the same time? Definitely. That's kind of cool. I'm not going to lie. I would flex like that. I mean, I... I don't know why I'm going to say this because I've literally never fenced once in my entire life, nor have I ever even, I think, seen it live. But I can imagine that, <laughs> like, it's not necessarily about how strong you are. Like, it could, sure, that helps, but it's much more important to be, like, quick. And if I you're, guess, like, a little yeah. girl that, you know, has been being taught and you just know the movements and you can do them, like, really routinely and very quickly, that must be, give just give you an advantage. I think it's a sport of skill and agility. Yes. Yeah, more so than strength. Mm -hmm. I totally agree. And like you said, to be exposed to it from such a young age. Right. That seems to be really key in learning. The more we learn about learning <laughs> is if you learn something young, you're much more likely to excel at it later. That makes a lot of sense, right? So when As you you're think growing about up. Yeah. When you think about your kids, whatever you want them to be good at, you should probably expose them to it really young. Okay. That's good for us to know. Mm -hmm. I've thought about this. At nauseum <laughs> <laughs> in terms of uh, language exposure. I really want to expose our future little weirdos to lots of languages when they're young. Like at least a dozen, you think? At least a dozen, yeah. I want them to know 12 languages. <laughs> I only know one and a half, but our kids, they'll know 12. Exactly. <laughs> well, uh, in addition to Julie growing up in this very unconventional way, um, unfortunately, at only the age of 14 or 15 years old, she actually became the mistress of Count de Almanac, which was her father's boss. I hate, I just hate like <laughs> old timey people for doing this stuff. Yeah, whenever there are kids involved in any sort of quote unquote like romantic relationship. I know, I hate it. I didn't know like it, they didn't view it the same way as we view it today, but I still, I mean, but that also. All the di undiagnosed trauma that they must have gone through. Totally. And I mean, we see this in ancient times. We, I mean, yeah, like this is what dawn of the 18th century. Yeah. Terrible. Mm -hmm. I was, I, I put a note in here saying like today we understand that the power imbalance in that type of relationship is disgusting. And it's, I don't know if it's possible to consent when you're a 14 year old, No. let alone a 14 year old who that's your dad's boss. Right. Um, That's but so gross. But I kept finding that when different sources would reference them, they referenced them as lovers. So I just wanted to put yeah, into quote unquote lovers. I wanted to give my opinion that that's not accurate. Right. Right. Uh, but it also, to your point earlier, that type of relationship wouldn't have been uncommon in Versailles specifically. The was, uh, in addition to their meticulous rituals and routines it was also known for a lot of debauchery and weird behavior like that let's just be real they're perverts <laughs> <laughs> that is how it tends to be portrayed at least yeah, yeah. That's, that's my impression of it so then for poor julie her father dies in around 1687 and the uh, armnac the guy that's her dad's boss he sets her up with a husband Weirdly Man, this enough. is a wild time. The guy who she marries is uh, Jean de Maupin, who was a clerk. And Maupin gave Julie the surname by which she was known professionally when they called her La Maupin. Or it's spelled in English uh, Maupin, but you just wouldn't pronounce it that way in French. Mm -hmm. Just in case folks are wondering, it's M-A-U-P-I-N. But the morning after their wedding... 
the guy, Maupin, was sent off again by Dagnac, the guy who Julie is uh, in a relationship with. He's like, okay, now that you married her, I actually have a job for you far away <laughs> in the provinces doing some tax collecting. And <laughs> the dude was apparently described as being really timid and submissive, so he goes the day after his wedding. And apparently Julie thought he was really boring. Oof. It didn't seem to be a good match, and she was much more adventurous than he. Well, also, she's, like, a child, so yeah, definitely at this not going to be a good match. At this point, she might be, like, 16 or 17. Okay. So, b- still a child. Yeah. yeah. So, Julie gets bored of her marriage to the timid tax collector <laughs> and runs off with a man named Serran. Oh, wow. So, like, a third man. Yes. Who is a famous fencing master at the time. But the runaway lovers had no money. So they earned what they could, giving fencing demonstrations at fairs and in taverns. Apparently, one time, a male spectator insisted that La Maupin must actually be a man because her fencing skills were, quote, too good. And to shut him up, Julie flashed the audience (laughs) (laughs) to prove that she was female. That is so amazing and terrible and hilarious all at once yes i agree it definitely speaks to her rebelliousness right Right, that is true also it's i feel like that's very french very french yes she began her singing career with the marseille opera marseille is a place in france yes and um she had a lot of admirers she was very beautiful very talented very charismatic and at some point, she loses um, this relationship with the guy, Sehan, the fencing master. Is she still technically married? I don't know. I, I never saw anything about the marriage being annulled or there being a divorce. So it could be that they remained married indefinitely but didn't have a life together. Right. So she gets this admirer who is a young woman uh, from Marseille who comes from like a pretty wealthy merchant family and these two women fall in love. However, the woman, her name is unknown, Mm -hmm. unfortunately, her family finds out and they freak out and they send her off to a convent to become a nun in Avignon. That's kind of amazing and hilarious and terrible. (laughs) It's a little extreme. (laughs) It's so extreme. But I feel like that was just like the thing to do back in the day. Mm-hmm. You know, if you're viewed as devious for the time, you're going to be a nun or you're going to be a priest or whatever. Yeah, it's quite a, an extreme punishment. <laughs> it is. But they weren't anticipating what Julie would do in order to get her love back. Ooh. She followed her to Avignon, helped her escape the convent one night, and then... She burned it to the ground. (laughs) Oh, my God. That's wild. Yes. (laughs) They were on the run from the law for three months. There were outstanding warrants for Julie, but I think from what I understood, the charges were dropped because people were like, there's no way that a woman went to go kidnap another woman. Right. What are you talking about? That's so weird. Nice. So they just kind of let it go because they were so uncomfortable. (laughs) With the idea, with the idea of it, like a woman kidnapped a nun in training and then burned down a convent. Yeah, they were just like not having it. Woman can't do that. Exactly. So they were on the run for three months. I'm sure that was a very exciting time for them. Right. But it does seem like they broke up, and uh, Julie's love did return to her family. So after this love affair, La Maupin continues her travels on her own, and one day. While in Paris, she literally bumps in to this young man. He's a noble named Comte d'Albert, which looks like Comte d'Albert in English. <laughs> Comte d'Albert? Yeah. <laughs> she bumps into him, and he's so pissed, he challenges her to a duel because he thinks she's a man because she's dressed in men's clothing. And then she beats him. Not like in a fencing duel? Yes. Not only does she beat him, but she wounds him really badly. And she apparently feels bad about it because she sticks around and nurses him back to health. Wow. <laughs> so not only did he get his ass kicked, <laughs> she helped get him better. <laughs> that's amazing. And that's how I met your mother. According to some sources, the two had a great oh my God, no way. romance. 
and according to others, they were just lifelong besties. Okay. But either way, that's such a wild way to meet. That would be like a really interesting meet cute in a film. That would be. That's kind of amazing. Mm-hmm. So while in Paris, La Maupin wanted to join the Paris Opera, right? As I had shared, she had already been a part of the opera in Narsay. And um, even though she was really talented and had like kind of like a fan base at this point, the Paris Opera would have been the next level. Like this would have been very legitimate for her. Mm-hmm. However, when she goes to audition, they refuse her, not due to her singing, but due to her reputation and her outstanding legal issues. You see, our gal was known for dueling people left and right, but dueling was actually illegal. It was uh, King Louis himself hated dueling, and it was a big offense to duel. Uh, You could not draw a sword in the presence of the king or else you'd be killed. Right. But you weren't allowed to duel in France in general. I think, or maybe specifically Paris, I actually can't remember if the law extended to all of France, but she was dueling everywhere. Yeah, and and the authorities didn't like that. She was a little too punk rock for the time. She really was. (laughs) But being punk rock, as you say, (laughs) she was not one to give up. If you or someone you know is having thoughts of suicide or experiencing a mental health or substance use crisis, 988 provides 24-7 compassionate support and connection to trained counselors. When you call, text, or chat 988, you'll be quickly connected to trained counselors who will listen to your concerns, provide support, and connect you to additional resources if needed. There is hope. The lifeline works. You are not alone. For 24-7 support, just call, text, or chat 988. Las ciberofertas de JCPenney están a solo un clic hasta el martes. Encuentra ahorros en jcp.com y acaba con tu lista de regalos. Con miles de ofertas como hasta 60% de descuento en mantas térmicas y decorativas. O ropa de invierno para todos desde $14.99. Consciente a esa persona especial con joyería con diamantes y piedras preciosas y es please a solo $19.99. JCPenney, celebraciones que valen la pena. Ofertas válidas en selección de estilos hasta el 28 de noviembre solo en línea. Aplican exclusiones. Las ciberofertas se excluyen de los cupones. Detalles en jcp.com. She befriended a very well-respected elderly opera singer named Bouvard, and he vouched for her with the opera. And she also reached out to her old, quote-unquote, friend, Darnac, the guy that oh, yeah. was her dad's boss. And she pleads with him to get a pardon from the king himself for her dueling charges. That's amazing. I have no idea what she could have said to him or what he could have said to the king to make that happen. Right. Like, because there was so much evidence that she had dueled so many witnesses. She was known for it. It does. If the king is like, eh, I pardon you, it doesn't matter. He's an absolute monarch. Of course, yes, yeah. I know that. But I'm just wondering, what could you say to convince the king when he found it so offensive? Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, I have no idea. Maybe he's like, feel bad for me, please. I'm pretty. Maybe. Um, <laughs> I've no, I mean, that's the only thing that came out of my mouth because I have literally no idea. Yeah. Well, it sounds like a crazy plan, but it worked. Yay! The king pardons her, and she was able to join the opera in 1960. You mean 1690? Yeah. Sorry, guys. I have dyscalculia. <laughs> I'm like, that would be pretty amazing. In 1960. Could you imagine? That would be pretty crazy. And yeah. she went on to tour with the Beatles. <laughs> No, no, in 1690. I'm surprised that th- has that happened before on the podcast. I don't think it ever has. I mean, maybe it has, but I haven't. I can't remember. That's impressive, actually, because I legitimately what? do have dyscalculia, which is dyslexia, but with numbers. Um, she performed regularly with the Paris Opera from 1690. <laughs> there we go. To 1694. Uh, she was first singing in major productions as a soprano. And later, in her more natural contra alto range. I don't know what that means, but I figured some weirdos would know what that means. So I decided to share it. (laughs) The Marquis de Dango 
that name I have no idea if I'm pronouncing correctly, but a marquis, so an, an important nobleman of the time, wrote in his journal of a performance given by La Maupin that hers was, quote, the most beautiful voice in the world. So sweet. So Julie was so talented that she even sang for the king at the court of Versailles on a number of occasions. So she got to go back as a performer. So maybe that was part of her pardon. He he <laughs> wanted private concerts? Exactly. That would be really awesome. <laughs> so I'll up. give you that pardon, but you have to sing for me. I could see a president doing that maybe with like um, some pop star or something. JFK and Marilyn Monroe. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> that was a scandalous <laughs> reference. Yeah. I think it was a little bit more than singing there. <laughs> <laughs> so according to various biographical accounts of her life, La Maupin continued a life of passion and scandal, even as a prestigious opera singer. For example, one account tells the story of how Julie was at a ball, having a good time, and she kissed a young woman publicly. <laughs> and the men in attendance were very upset about this. Oh, very upset, yeah. And she ended up beating three men in a duel that very night outside of the ball. <laughs> like, I'm assuming like one after another, right? I'm assuming, but I don't know for sure. But that would be cool if it was all at the same time. Right? I love that. I, I love that image. <laughs> yeah. She also continued to wear men's clothes in public, and she uh, publicly, more or less, had relationships with both men and women. So despite her many scandals, she remained a beloved figure in the world of opera and in fencing, and people just loved that she was such a wild character. Right. She continued to perform and fight until her retirement, it says, in 1705, which I think is she would have been so young. Yeah, wait a minute. Wasn't she born, didn't you say, like 1670? 16, let me go back up in my notes, because you know I'm not going to remember that. Yeah, 1670. Yeah, 1670, 1673. Maybe 73. Mm -hmm. So, like, at most, she's 35? Mm-hmm. That's Isn't that so nuts? weird. Yeah. Um, but it said that that was her retirement, and then she dies in 1707 at the age of roughly 37. And although the exact cause of her death is unknown, there are a few different theories. This is so strange all of a sudden. Yeah. Okay, let's hear the theories. One theory is that she died of tuberculosis, which was a common cause of death at the time. Right. Another theory is that she died of cancer, and she had been reportedly privately suffering from a very painful tumor for mm. a long time. And some sources even claim that she had been poisoned by a jealous lover. Oh, snap. That's the most juicy. Do you want to know where she met her end where in a convent oh my god no. isn't that was she funny? trying to break someone else out <laughs> imagine and while she was there she's like wait i gotta die <laughs> peace isn't that nuts i think um different nun orders are known for different things kind of like different priest orders a right. lot of nuns and their orders are known for healing for medicine mm -hmm. so it's possible she went there for like medical help uh, that and makes sense. just ended up passing away there but yeah, she uh, burned down one convent and passed away in another. Okay. <laughs> That's a wild ride right there. <laughs> yes. And then fast forward to her legacy a little bit. In 1835, famous French writer Theophile is how it's spelled in English. I would think that is Théophile, maybe, in French. But what an ugly name. That's I just got to say it. Yeah, that's a <laughs> terrible name. Theophile. Theo, my name's Theophile. Um, I'm going to say it in French because I think it'll sound cuter. Théophile Gautier. He was a famous French novelist, and he wrote a novel based on the life of Julie Daubny titled Mademoiselle du Maupin. The novel celebrated sensual love regardless of gender. Oh, snap. And this was very radical for the time. Yeah. So it was a big hit in France, and it was banned in the United States. <laughs> <laughs> um, why am I not surprised? It was banned for um, the reason of this committee that wanted to supervise the morality of the public. Oh, my God. And I wrote LOL next to that in my notes. That is, that, this is so stereotypically French and then also so stereotypically American, just like all in one. Right? That yeah. statement right there. 
Well, Julie's legacy lives on today through the many stories and legends that have been passed down about her. She was a true trailblazer who defied gender norms of her time and lived life on her own terms, which is why I think she's such a great character to talk about for Pride. Oh, yeah. Because that's exactly what Pride is about, is living life on your own terms, being authentically you, no matter what other people say. Her incredible talent and bravery, as well as her life of romance, continue to inspire people around the world to this day. Oh, very nice. Because, I mean, who doesn't want to grow up and be an opera singer and a fencer? Right? All in one. All in one. And to be known for your uh, love affairs (laughs) across France. (laughs) (laughs) Burning down convents. I mean, I haven't burned down any convents recently. I really got to step up my game. Would you burn down a convent for me? Absolutely. Just making sure, like, no one's inside of it, obviously. Yeah, obviously. I don't want anyone to die, (laughs) but, like, would I burn down a convent for you? Of course. Thanks. That's so sweet. (laughs) Yeah. Well, my sources for this week are, they're really good sources. I actually highly recommend them. One was the LA Public Library. Oh, very cool. Yeah, they had an article on her. Um, again, uh, for them as well, in like an old Pride series they had about historical figures. Oh. So, yay, LA Public Library. Very nice. And then an article written by an author named Kelly Gardner, who, based on the article that I read, it seemed like she was researching Julie for a book. Mm -hmm. I don't know if she wrote a book on her or not, but the article was called The Real Life of Julie Dobney. I also found a lot of really good information on the website History Extra and then tied it all together with Wikipedia, of course. Of course. <laughs> what would history be well, for weirdos be without Wikipedia, you know? What would history be oh my without God. Wikipedia? <laughs> <laughs> and that is the story. Well, thank you so much. I actually learned a lot because I had never even heard of her until l- this episode. I had not heard of her until our lovely listener Meg suggested it. So thank you again, Meg, because this was a really cool one to research. Yeah, she definitely encapsulates a weirdo. Like yes, <laughs> and 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 like a, a good way, not the best way, but I think a more more or less like a really good way. In a punk rock way. In a punk rock way. Yeah, <laughs> which is pretty cool. I like that a lot. It, you can obviously tell, guys, that I'm I very much so like punk rock music. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm sure that was obvious. Yeah. In <laughs> case it wasn't obvious. <laughs> well, I hope you enjoyed the episode. Okay, Stephanie, that was incredible. Weirdos, you know the drill. If you haven't already, follow us on Instagram at history for weirdos And also, I haven't mentioned this in a while, you can also email us at historyforweirdos at gmail.com. We are getting through all of those also very slowly, but we always appreciate all the love the gratitude and the good suggestions you all give us you guys have some amazing suggestions and trust us like we're categorizing them like we're definitely we're we're taking them so if if, even if you don't get a a response from us we do see them so we really appreciate all the messages you guys send yeah thank you so much weirdos okay weirdos until next time until next week adios Okay, weirdos, have any of you made it this far? Genuinely curious. If so, congrats. This is this week's Easter egg. So, you've got an idea for a business. The store of your dreams. There's just one thing to figure out. Everything. That's why Shopify's all-in-one commerce platform makes it easy to sell online, in person, and everywhere else. Sell on social media, source products with an app to get that first sale feeling. It's the only solution that gives you everything you need to sell everywhere you want. So when you're ready to bring your idea to life, power it up with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash profits 23. Las ciber ofertas de JCPenney están a solo un clic hasta el martes. Encuentra ahorros en jcp.com y acaba con tu lista de regalos. Con miles de ofertas como hasta 60% de descuento en mantas térmicas y decorativas. O ropa de invierno para todos desde $14.99. Consiente a esa persona especial con joyería con diamantes y piedras preciosas Yes Please a solo $19.99. JCPenney, celebraciones que valen la pena. Ofertas válidas en selección de estilos hasta el 28 de noviembre solo en línea. Aplican exclusiones. Las ciber ofertas se excluyen de los cupones. Detalles en jcp.com.